what if I told you that everything you know about fruit was wrong? Not kind of wrong. Not technically wrong. Completely, deeply, fundamentally wrong. Because the fruits you see in your kitchen, those bright bananas, crisp apples, juicy watermelons, weren't gifts from untouched nature. They were made, engineered, sculpted by human hands over thousands of years. We didn't stumble upon perfect fruit, we created it. And along the way, we made decisions, some brilliant, others irreversible, that still shape how we eat today. Let's start with the fruit most people assume is just natural. The banana. It's soft, seedless, and easy to peel. You toss it into smoothies or lunchboxes without a second thought. But the banana we know is an illusion, a carefully maintained one. In the humid rainforests of Southeast Asia over 7,000 years ago, wild bananas, Musa acuminata and Musa balbiciana, grew in the shadows. These fruits looked nothing like modern bananas. They were stumpy, filled with enormous black seeds and barely edible. But early foragers noticed something odd. Every now and then, a banana plant would produce a mutant fruit with more flesh and fewer seeds. These were accidents of nature. But humans saw an opportunity. They began propagating these rare plants, not from seed, but by cutting and transplanting the underground rhizomes, creating genetic copies. In doing so, they began the first agricultural cloning experiment in human history. Over thousands of years, this led to the domesticated banana. Soft, seedless, sterile. The banana couldn't reproduce on its own anymore. But that didn't matter. Humans took over reproduction. We kept making more. In the 1800s, when bananas reached the Americas via colonial trade, the most popular variety was the Gros Michel a thick-skinned, creamy, highly shippable fruit. But by the 1950s, a fungal disease called Panama disease wiped out entire plantations. The banana industry nearly collapsed, so growers pivoted to the Cavendish, a variety less flavorful but resistant to the disease. The Cavendish became the global banana, and because it too is sterile, every Cavendish on Earth is genetically identical. Today, a new mutation of Panama disease Tropical Race 4 is creeping across continents. The banana we eat every day, it's one mutation away from extinction. We made the banana, but we also built its Achilles heel. Now picture an apple, a symbol of health and beauty. But the apple's journey is a story of chaos, forced into order. Apples come from Kazakhstan, specifically from the Tian Shan Mountains, where wild apples known as Malus Siversi still grow. These trees produce apples in every form imaginable. Some sweet, some bitter, some so tart they curl your tongue. And here's the trick. Plant an apple seed and you won't get the apple it came from. You'll get something totally different. That's because apples are extreme heterozygotes. Their seeds are genetic lottery tickets. Thousands of years ago, early farmers learned to work around this by grafting, attaching branches from desirable apple trees onto hardy rootstocks. This preserved flavor, texture, and predictability. By the time apples reached Europe, Roman horticulturists were already documenting different varieties. In the Middle Ages, apple orchards spread across monasteries and estates. Each variety, Golden Russet, Baldwin, Pippin, was kept alive by careful grafting. But modern apples are more engineered than ever. Today's most popular apples, Fuji, Gala, Honeycrisp, are carefully bred hybrids selected not only for flavor but firmness, sugar content, color, and shipping resilience. The Red Delicious, once the king of apples, was so aggressively bred for its bright red skin that its flavor declined and consumers abandoned it. Today, apple breeding is more like software design, patented, tested, refined for a global market. The apple's original chaos has been streamlined, and in that streamlining, much of its wild diversity was lost. Next, the watermelon. The modern watermelon is bright red, juicy, and often seedless. But that wasn't always the case. The earliest watermelons were cultivated in ancient Nubia and Egypt. Not for their sweetness, but for their water content. In the deserts of Africa, a fruit that could store clean water was a miracle. These early melons had pale white or green flesh and were bitter, even astringent. Over centuries, farmers in Africa and the Middle East began saving seeds from the rare melons that were slightly sweeter or redder. 
They passed these seeds down, refining the fruit over millennia. By 2000 years ago, watermelon had spread into the Mediterranean. In the 1600s, European artists painted watermelons with swirled flesh and sparse color, evidence that the modern watermelon was still under construction. Fast forward to the 20th century, American agriculturalists began crossing watermelon lines to maximize sugar, red pigment, and rind thickness. Eventually, they developed triploid watermelons, plants with three sets of chromosomes that produce no viable seeds. To grow a seedless watermelon, you need to breed two separate types of plants and control their pollination. It's like growing a child from parents who can't reproduce on their own. Seedless watermelons are a marvel, but also a warning. Without human intervention, they would vanish. Now imagine a strawberry. Sweet, red, heart-shaped. With its seeds on the outside, it looks natural, but it's not. Before the 1700s, strawberries were small and wild. In Europe, people harvested Fregaria vesca, the alpine strawberry, a fragrant but tiny fruit. Meanwhile, in the Americas, a different species, Fregaria virginiana, grew across woodlands. These were slightly larger, still small, but incredibly hardy. When a French explorer named Amade Francois Frézier brought back a Chilean strawberry, Fregaria kiloensis, it wouldn't flower properly in Europe. But when planted near the North American species, the two crossbred naturally. The result was a hybrid that had large, sweet fruit with firm flesh and a beautiful red color. French growers noticed they began cultivating it deliberately. Thus was born the garden strawberry, Fragaria times ananasa, a fruit that had never existed in nature. Since then, strawberries have been shaped for commerce. They are cloned through runners to preserve uniformity, bred for shape and shipping strength. But modern supermarket strawberries often lack the deep flavor of their ancestors, traded for cosmetics and shelf life. We gave strawberries size, but took away their soul. Now, let's talk about the orange. The orange seems timeless, pure, but it's a man-made cocktail of fruit genetics. Thousands of years ago in China and northeastern India, Farmers began crossing the pomelo, large and sour, with the mandarin, small and sweet. The result was the sweet orange, juicy, aromatic, and balanced. From there, oranges spread through trade. Arab traders carried them to the Middle East. Moorish Spain grew them in royal gardens. By the time Portuguese explorers reached the Americas, they brought orange seeds with them. But like apples, oranges don't grow true from seed. To preserve their flavor, humans had to graft them. Every Valencia or navel orange is the result of cloning. The navel orange, in fact, can't reproduce on its own. It doesn't even have viable pollen. Every navel orange on Earth is a descendant of a single mutation from the 1800s. In the 20th century, massive orange groves in Florida and Brazil began producing fruit at scale. But monoculture had consequences. A bacterial infection called Huang Long Bing, or citrus greening, is now destroying trees across the globe. There is no cure. The orange, once humanity's sweetest invention, may become its next agricultural ghost. Let's continue with a fruit that came into existence entirely by mistake, and yet changed entire economies. The grapefruit. Unlike ancient fruits like the apple or banana, the grapefruit is a modern newcomer. It didn't exist in the wild, it wasn't gradually bred. It emerged by accident in the early 1700s, on the island of Barbados. There, in a Caribbean orchard filled with imported citrus, a sweet orange tree and a pomelo tree cross-pollinated, completely on their own. The hybrid that resulted was something new. A large, thick-rinded fruit with tart, aromatic flesh, packed with bitterness and citrus oils. It didn't fit in. It didn't look like an orange or a pomelo, but it was captivating. Locals noticed the way it grew in bunches, clusters that resembled grapes, and gave it the name grapefruit. By the 1800s, Florida citrus growers began cultivating grapefruit commercially. Despite its strong taste, the fruit gained popularity, especially for breakfast, but many found its bitterness off-putting. So, in the mid-20th century, American researchers took the grapefruit in a radical direction. 
they began experimenting with radiation breeding, a technique where seeds are bombarded with gamma rays to induce random mutations. One of these mutations led to the ruby-red grapefruit, sweeter, pinker, and more marketable than the original white-fleshed variety. It was so popular that Texas made it the state fruit. And today's grapefruits? Almost all of them are cloned from those original mutants, created in labs, refined in test orchards, and sustained through propagation, not seeds. The grapefruit was never discovered. It was never supposed to exist. It was built, first by accident and then by design. Now turn your attention to the pineapple. It looks like a spiky alien relic, a fruit that defies simplicity. And that's because it isn't simple at all. The pineapple isn't one fruit. It's dozens of small fruits fused together around a central core. Its story begins in South America, in what is now Paraguay and southern Brazil. Indigenous people there began cultivating a family of plants called bromeliads, short, hardy, tropical plants with small, tough, sour fruit. Over centuries, they crossbred these species, selecting for plants that produced multiple fruitlets in close clusters. They refined them for flavor, aroma, and juiciness, slowly coaxing dozens of hard, woody fruits into one unified, sugary whole. By the time Christopher Columbus arrived in the Caribbean in 1493, the pineapple had already become a refined delicacy in the region. Europeans were stunned. The taste, texture, and tropical freshness of the fruit had no European comparison. It became a symbol of wealth and luxury. In fact, in 17th and 18th century Europe, pineapples were so valuable that people rented them for dinner parties. Some never even ate them, just displayed them. But the pineapple doesn't grow from seed. It grows from crowns, the leafy tops of other pineapples. To scale production, farmers began cloning pineapples using these crowns or suckers from the base of the plant. Today, most commercial pineapples are genetically identical. They're grown in plantations using chemical flower inducers to force uniform growth and harvested before ripening so they can survive shipping across the world. It's not a fruit you just grow, it's a fruit you engineer. Next, consider the lemon. Not sweet, not soft, but essential. The lemon is not a wild fruit. It's a hybrid, a cross between the bitter orange and the citron, and it likely originated in northern India or southern China around 2,000 years ago. Unlike other fruits, the lemon wasn't valued for taste. It was prized for its acid. That acidity served many purposes. It preserved food before refrigeration. It treated wounds. And most famously, it became a weapon against scurvy, a disease caused by vitamin C deficiency that plagued sailors during long sea voyages. By the time of the Islamic Golden Age, lemons were cultivated across the Mediterranean, from Persia to Sicily. They became central to Arab medicine, Mediterranean cooking, and eventually European commerce. Modern lemons, however, are no longer grown from seeds. They're propagated through cuttings and grafting, producing genetically identical trees. Even seedless lemons, like the popular Lisbon and Eureka varieties, are the result of deliberate breeding programs, chosen not for flavor, but for functionality and food prep. The lemon wasn't bred to be loved, it was bred to solve problems. And now let's look at the peach. Fragrant, velvety, juicy, but its ancestor over 4,000 years ago in China was anything but luxurious. The original peach was small, about the size of a large cherry. Its flesh was tough and dry. Its flavor? Closer to an almond than anything sweet. But Chinese horticulturists were relentless. Over generations, they selected trees that bore larger, sweeter, juicier fruit. They gradually increased sugar content, softened texture, and deepened color. By 1000 BCE, peaches were already symbols of immortality in Chinese poetry and art. When they reached Persia, they became known as Persian apples. The Romans spread them through Europe. The Spanish brought them to the Americas. Modern peaches are 64 times larger, 4,000% sweeter, and 27% juicier than their wild ancestors. But with that perfection came fragility. Peaches bruise easily. They rot fast. They must be picked and shipped with precision. Today, many are grafted onto disease-resistant rootstocks. 
Their growth is controlled with pruning and fertilization schedules. The peach became perfection, but lost its resilience. It is maybe more than any fruit, a mirror of what humans want from nature. Let's now pit stop at one of the oldest and most manipulated stone fruits of all, the cherry. Its wild ancestor, Prunus avium, originated in the Anatolian region of modern-day Turkey, where forests still produce tiny, tart cherries for birds and animals. The fruit was brought to Rome by Lucius Licinius Lucullus, a Roman general returning from a campaign around 70 BCE. He was so obsessed with the fruit that he planted orchards across Italy and exported it across the Roman Empire. But these cherries weren't the sweet, fat globes we see in supermarkets today. They were small, sour, and fragile. What followed was 2,000 years of refinement. In medieval Europe, monks and nobles bred cherry trees for their size, flavor, and resilience to northern climates. In the United States, cherry breeding exploded in the 19th and 20th centuries, especially in Michigan and Washington, where farmers developed varieties that could survive colder winters and produce heavier yields. Today's cherries are engineered for their color, skin firmness, and shelf stability. Most commercial cherry trees are grafted, not grown from seed. Each orchard is a forest of clones, manicured, maintained, and chemically protected from pests and fungi. The cherry's origin is war and empire. Its present is patents and propagation. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like and subscribe to see more videos like this. And tell us in the comments what video you guys would like to see next. As always, we'll see you guys in the next one.